Part 4 of The Fly, written by Georges Langlin, narrated by Edward E. French. It was only on reaching home as I walked from the garage to the house that I read the inscription on the envelope. To whom it may concern, in parenthesis, probably Commissaire Shella, having told the servants that I would have only a light supper to be served immediately in my study and that I was not to be disturbed after, I ran upstairs, threw Helene's envelope on my desk, and made another careful search of the room before closing the shutters and drawing the curtains. All I could find was a long, dead mosquito stuck to the wall near the ceiling. Having motioned to the servant to put her tray down on a table by the fireplace, I poured myself a glass of wine and locked the door behind her. I then disconnected the telephone. I always did this now at night, and turned out all the lights but the lamp on my desk. Slitting open Helene's fat envelope, I extracted a thick wad of closely written pages. I read the following lines, neatly centered in the middle of the top page. This is not a confession, because, although I killed my husband, I am not a murderess. I simply and very faithfully carried out his last wish by crushing his head and right arm under the steam hammer of his brother's factory. Without even touching the glass of wine by my elbow, I turned the page and started reading. For very nearly a year before his death, the manuscript began, my husband had told me of some of his experiments. He knew full well that his colleagues of the air ministry would have forbidden some of them as too dangerous, but he was keen on obtaining positive results before reporting his discovery. Whereas only sound and pictures had been, so far, transmitted through space by radio and television, Andre claimed to have discovered a way of transmitting matter. Matter! Any solid object placed in his transmitter was instantly disintegrated and reintegrated in a special receiving set. Andre considered his discovery as perhaps the most important since that of the wheel sawn off the end of a tree trunk. He reckoned that the transmission of matter by instantaneous disintegration reintegration would completely change life as we had known it so far. It would mean the end of all means of transport, not only of goods, including food, but also of human beings. Andre, the practical scientist who never allowed theories or daydreams to get the better of him, already foresaw the time when there would no longer be any airplanes, ships, trains, or cars, and, therefore, no longer any roads or railway lines, ports, airports, or stations. All that would be replaced by matter-transmitting and receiving stations throughout the world. Travelers and goods would be placed in special cabins and, at a given signal, would simply disappear and reappear almost immediately at the chosen receiving station. Andre's receiving set was only a few feet away from his transmitter in an adjoining room of his laboratory and at first he ran into all sorts of snags. His first successful experiment was carried out with an ash tray taken from his desk, a souvenir we had brought back from a trip to London. That was the first time he told me about his experiments, and I had no idea of what he was talking about the day he came dashing into the house and threw the ash tray in my lap. Helene, look, for a fraction of a second, a, a bare ten millionth of a second, that ashtray had been completely disintegrated. For one little moment it no longer existed. Gone. Nothing left. Absolutely nothing. Only atoms traveling through space at the speed of light. And the moment after, the atoms were once more gathered together in the shape of an ashtray. Andre, please. Oh, please, what on earth are you raving about? He started sketching all over a letter I had been writing. He laughed at my wry face, swept all my letters off the table, and said, Don't you understand? All oh, right, let's start all over again. Helene, do you remember I once read you an article about the mysterious flying stones that seem to come from nowhere in particular, and which are said to occasionally fall in certain houses in India? They come flying in as though thrown from outside and that, in spite of closed doors and windows. 
Yes, I remember. I also remember that Professor Angers, your friend of the Collège de France, who had come down for a few days, remarked that if there was no trickery about it, the only possible explanation was that the stones had been disintegrated after having been thrown from outside, come through the walls, and then been reintegrated before hitting the floor or the opposite walls. That's right. And I added that there was, of course, one other possibility, namely the momentary and partial disintegration of the walls as the stone or stones came through. Yes, André, I remember all that, and I suppose you also remember that I failed to understand, and that you got quite annoyed. Well, I still do not understand why and how even disintegrated stones should be able to come through a wall or a closed door. But it is possible, Helene, because the atoms that go to make up matter are not close together like the bricks of a wall. They are separated by relative immensities of space. Do you mean to say that you have disintegrated that ash tray and then put it together again after pushing it through something? Precisely, Helene. I projected it through the wall that separates my transmitter from my receiving set. And would it be foolish to ask how humanity is to benefit from ashtrays that go through walls? André seemed quite offended, but he soon saw that I was only teasing, and again waxing enthusiastic. He told me of some of the possibilities of his discovery. Isn't it wonderful, Helene? He finally gasped, out of breath. Yes, André. But I hope you won't ever transmit me. <laughs> I'd be too much afraid of coming out at the other end like your ashtray. What do you mean? Do you remember what was written under that ashtray? Yes, of course. Made in Japan. That was the great joke of our typically British souvenir. The words are still there, André. But look! He took the ashtray out of my hands, frowned, and walked over to the window. Then he went quite pale, and I knew that he had seen what had proved to me that he had indeed carried out a strange experiment. The three words were still there, but reversed and reading. Made in Japan. Without a word, having completely forgotten me, André rushed off to his laboratory. I only saw him the next morning, tired and unshaven after a whole night's work. A few days later, André had a new reverse, which put him out of sorts and made him fussy and grumpy for several weeks. I stood it patiently enough for a while, but being myself bad-tempered one evening, we had a silly row over some futile thing, and I reproached him for his moroseness. I'm sorry, Sherry, I've been working my way through a maze of problems and have given you all a very rough time. You see, my very first experiment with a live animal proved a complete fiasco. Andre, you tried that experiment with Dandolo, didn't you? Yes. How did you know? he answered sheepishly. He disintegrated perfectly, but he never reappeared in the receiving set. Oh, Andre! What became of him, then? Nothing. There's just no more Dandolo, only the dispersed atoms of a cat wandering God knows where in the universe. Dandolo was a small white cat the cook had found one morning in the garden and which we had promptly adopted. Now I knew how it had disappeared and was quite angry about the whole thing. But my husband was so miserable over it all that I said nothing. I saw very little of my husband during the next few weeks. He had most of his meals sent down to the laboratory. I would often wake up in the morning and find his bed unslept in. Sometimes, if he had come in very late, I would find that storm-swept appearance which only a man can give a bedroom by getting up very early and fumbling around in the dark. One evening he came home to dinner all smiles, and I knew his troubles were over. His face dropped, however, when he saw I was dressed for going out. Oh, were you going out, Helene? Yes, the Drions invited me for a game of bridge. But I can easily phone them and put it off. No, it's all right. It isn't all right. Out with it, dear. Well, at last I've got everything perfect, and I wanted you to be the first to see the miracle. Magnifique, André. Of course I'll be delighted. 
Having telephoned our neighbors to say how sorry I was and so forth, I ran down to the kitchen and told the cook that she had exactly ten minutes in which to prepare a celebration dinner. An excellent idea, Helene, said my husband when the maid appeared with champagne after our candlelight dinner. We'll celebrate with reintegrated champagne. And taking the tray from the maid's hands, he led the way down to the laboratory. Do you think it will be as good as before its disintegration? I asked, holding the tray while he opened the door and switched on the lights. Have no fear, you'll see. Just bring it here, will you? He said, opening the door of a telephone call box he had bought and which had been transformed into what he called a transmitter. Put it down on that now, he added, putting a stool inside the box. Having carefully closed the door, he took me to the other end of the room and handed me a pair of very dark sunglasses. He put on another pair and walked back to a switchboard by the transmitter. Ready, Helene, said my husband, turning out all the lights. Don't remove your glasses till I give you the word. I won't budge, Andre. Go on, I told him, my eyes fixed on the tray, which I could see in a greenish shimmering light through the glass panel door of the telephone booth. Right, said Andre, throwing a switch. The whole room was brilliantly illuminated by an orange flash. Inside the cabin, I had seen a crackling ball of fire and felt its heat on my face, neck, and hands. The whole thing lasted but a fraction of a second, and I found myself blinking at green-edged black holes like those one sees after having stared at the sun. Et voilà! You can take off your glasses, Helene. A little theatrically, perhaps, my husband opened the door of the cabin. Though André had told me what to expect, I was astonished to find that the champagne, glasses, tray, and stool were no longer there. André ceremoniously led me by the hand into the next room, in a corner of which stood a second telephone booth. Opening the door wide, he triumphantly lifted the champagne tray off the stool. Feeling somewhat like a good-natured, kind member of the audience that has been dragged onto the music hall stage by the magician, I repressed from saying, all done with mirrors, which I knew would have annoyed my husband. Sure it's not dangerous to drink? I asked as the cork popped. Absolutely sure, Helene, he said, handing me a glass. But that was nothing. Drink this off and I'll show you something much more astounding. We went back into another room. Oh, Andre, remember poor Dandolo. This is only a guinea pig, Helene but I'm positive it will go through all right. He set the furry little beast down on the green enameled floor of the booth and quickly closed the door. I again put on my dark glasses and saw and felt the vivid crackling flash. Without waiting for André to open the door, I rushed into the next room where the lights were still on and looked into the receiving booth. Oh, André, chérie, he's there all right, I shouted excitedly, watching the little animal trotting round and round. It's wonderful, André. It works. You've succeeded. I hope so, but I must be patient. I'll know for sure in a few weeks' time. What do you mean? Look, he's as full of life as when you put him in the other cabin. Yes, so it seems, but we have to see if all his organs are intact, and that will take some time. If that little beast is still full of life in a month's time, we then consider the experiment a success. I begged Andre to let me take care of the guinea pig. All right. But don't kill it by overfeeding, he agreed with a grin for my enthusiasm. Though not allowed to take Hopla, the name I had given the guinea pig, out of its box in the laboratory, I had tied a pink ribbon round its neck and was allowed to feed it twice a day. Hopla soon got used to its pink ribbon and became quite a tame little pet. But that month of waiting seemed a year. Then one day André put Miquette, our cocker spaniel, into his transmitter. He had not told me beforehand, knowing full well that I would never have agreed to such an experiment with our dog. But when he did tell me, Miquette had been successfully transmitted half a dozen times, and seemed to be enjoying the operation thoroughly. No sooner was she let out of the reintegrator than she dashed madly into the next room, scratching at the transmitter door to have a, another go, as André called it. I now expected that my husband would invite some of his colleagues and air ministry specialists to come down. He usually did this when he had finished a research job, and before handing them long, detailed reports, which he always typed himself, he would carry out an experiment or two before them. But this time he just went on working. 
One morning, I finally asked him when he intended throwing his usual surprise party, as we called it. No, Helene, not for a long while yet. This discovery is much too important. I have an awful lot of work to do on it still. Do you realize that there are some parts of the transmission proper which I do not yet myself fully understand? It works all right, but you see, I can't just say to all these eminent professors that I do this and that and poof, it works. I must be able to explain how and why it works. And what is even more important, I must be ready and able to refute every destructive argument they will not fail to trot out, as they usually do when faced with anything really good. I was occasionally invited down to the laboratory to witness some new experiment, but I never went, unless André invited me, and only talked about his work if he broached the subject first. Of course, it never occurred to me that he would, at that stage at least, have tried an experiment with a human being. Though, had I thought about it, knowing André, it would have been obvious that he would never have allowed anyone into the transmitter before he had been through to test it first. It was only after the accident that I discovered he had duplicated all his switches inside the disintegration booth so that he could try it out on himself. The morning André tried this terrible experiment, he did not show up for lunch. I sent the maid down with a tray, but she brought it back with a note she had found pinned outside the laboratory door. Do not disturb me. I am working. He did occasionally pin such notes on his door, and though I noticed it. I paid no particular attention to the unusually large handwriting of his note. It was just after that, as I was drinking my coffee, that Henri came bouncing into the room to say that he had caught a funny fly, and would I like to see it. Refusing even to look at his closed fist, I ordered him to release it immediately. But, Mama, it has such a funny white head. Marching the boy over to the window, I told him to release the fly immediately, which he did. I knew that Henri had caught the fly merely because he thought it looked curious or different from other flies, but I also knew that his father would never stand for any form of cruelty to animals, and there would be a fuss should he discover that our son had put a fly in a box or a bottle. At dinner time that evening, Andre had still not shown up, and a little worried, I ran down to the laboratory and knocked at the door. He did not answer my knock, but I heard him moving around, and a moment later he slipped a note under the door. It was typewritten. Helene, I am having trouble. Put the boy to bed and come back in an hour's time. A. Frightened, I knocked and called, but André did not seem to pay any attention, and, vaguely reassured by the familiar noise of his typewriter, I went back to the house. Having put Henri to bed, I returned to the laboratory where I found another note slipped under the door. My hand shook as I picked it up because I knew by then that something must be radically wrong. I read, Helene, first of all I count on you not to lose your nerve or do anything rash, because you alone can help me. I have had a serious accident. I am not in any particular danger for the time being, though it is a matter of life and death. It is useless calling to me or saying anything. I cannot answer. I cannot speak. I want you to do exactly and very carefully all that I ask. After having knocked three times to show that you understand and agree, fetch me a bowl of milk laced with rum. I've had nothing all day and cannot do without it. Shaking with fear, not knowing what to think, and repressing a furious desire to call André and bang away until he opened, I knocked three times as requested, and ran all the way home to fetch what he wanted. In less than five minutes I was back. Another note had been slipped under the door. Helene, follow these instructions carefully. When you knock, I'll open the door. You are to walk over to my desk and put down the bowl of milk. You will then go into the other room where the receiver is. Look carefully and try to find a fly which ought to be there, but which I am unable to find. Unfortunately, I cannot see small things very easily. Before you come in, you must promise to obey me implicitly. Do not look at me and remember that talking is quite useless. I cannot answer. 
Knock again three times, and that will mean I have your promise. My life depends entirely on the help you can give me.